Coming up, I'll be telling you about 12 brand new horror books that were just released in October, some in September, and one in August. Now, the one in August was originally slated for a November release. I just found out that it was already released months ago, so I had to include it in this video. There was one book that was originally supposed to come out in October, but it came out at the end of September. So that's going to be on here, as well as two books that came out in September that I had no idea about until after I released my September new release video. So I'm going to show you those four first and then get into the October releases, all of which came out on October the 4th. So all of these books are already out there, ready to be consumed. I had decided to split this video in two parts because there are so many books coming out in October. I think I had a list of about 20. And with the additional titles, I was like, there is no way I'm going to put all these books in one video. So I've split it in two. Next week will be the rest of the October releases. There's actually eight October releases in this video. Be sure you let me know down in the comments which of these you're going to add to your own TBR. I would love to know that. Without further ado, let's get right into it. On the run from a life of prostitution and poverty. Exotic dancer C.C. Dulak agrees to become the main attraction at an erotic seance hosted by an enigmatic mesmerist, Monsieur Rosignol. As the seance descends into depravity, C.C. falls prey to Rosignol's hypnotic power and becomes possessed by a malevolent spirit. George Dashwood, an aspiring artist, witnesses the seance and fears for Cece. He seeks her out and she seduces him, but she is no longer herself. The spirit controlling her forces her to commit increasingly depraved acts. When the spirit's desire for revenge escalates to murder, George and Cece must find a way to break Rosignol's spell before Cece's soul is condemned forever. Lucy LeBang is a star. For decades, this flamboyant drag artist has cast a spell over screen and stage. Now she's the leading lady in a smash hit musical. But as time takes its toll, Lucy fears her star is beginning to dim. When Lucy's co-star meets with a mysterious accident, a new ingenue shimmers onto the scene, Luda, whose fantastical beauty and sinister charm infatuate Lucy immediately, and who bears a striking resemblance to herself at a much younger age. Luda begs Lucy to share the secrets of her stardom and reveal the hidden tricks of her trade, for Lucy LeBang is a mistress of the glamour, a mysterious discipline that draws on sex, drugs, and the occult for its trans-like transformative effects. But as Lucy tutors her young protege in the art, their fellow actors and crew members begin meeting with untimely ends. Now Lucy wonders if Luda has mastered the glamour all too well and exploited it to achieve her dark ambitions. What follows is an intoxicating descent into the demimonde of Glasgow a fantastical city of dreams, and into the nightmarish heart of Luda herself, a femme fatale, a phenomenon, a monster, and perhaps the brightest star of them all. Shy high school junior Riley Kowalski is spending her winter break on a research trip to Antarctica, sponsored by one of the world's biggest tech companies. She joins five student volunteers, a company-approved chaperone, and an impartial scientist to prove that environmental plastic pollution has reached all the way to Antarctica. But what they find is something much worse. Something that looks human. Riley has anxiety, ostracized by the kids at school because of panic attacks. So when she starts to feel like something's wrong with their expedition leader, Greta, she writes it off. But when Greta snaps and tries to kill Riley, she can't chalk it up to an overactive imagination anymore. Worse, after watching Greta disintegrate, only to find another student with the same affliction, she realizes they haven't been infected, they've been infiltrated by something that can change its shape. 
and if the group isn't careful, that something could quickly replace any of them. When Ralph and Abby Lamb move in with Ralph's mother, Laura, Abby hopes it's just what she and her mother-in-law need to finally connect. After a traumatic childhood, Abby is desperate for a mother figure, especially now that she and Ralph are trying to become parents themselves. Abby just has so much love to give to Laura, to Ralph, and to Mrs. Bondi, her favorite resident at the long-term care home where she works. But Laura isn't interested in bonding with her daughter-in-law. She's venomous and cruel, especially to Abby, and life with her is hellish. When Laura takes her own life, her ghost haunts Abby and Ralph in very different ways. Ralph is plunged into depression, and Abby is terrorized by a force intent on destroying everything she loves. To make matters worse, Mrs. Bondi's daughter is threatening to move Mrs. Bondi from the home, leaving Abby totally alone. With everything on the line, Abby comes up with a chilling plan that will allow her to keep Mrs. Bondi, rescue Ralph from his tortured mind, and break Laura's hold on the family for good. All it requires is a little ingenuity, a lot of determination, and a unique recipe for chicken a la king. Decades after playing the titular killer in the 80s horror franchise, Night of the Reaper, Howard Browning has been reduced to signing autographs for his dwindling fan base at genre conventions. When the studio announces a series reboot, the aging thespian is crushed to learn he's being replaced in the iconic role by heartthrob Trevor Maine, a former sitcom child star who's fresh out of rehab. Trevor is determined to stay sober and revamp his image, while Howard refuses to let go of the character he created, setting the stage for a cross-generational clash over the soul of a monster. But as Howard fights to reclaim his legacy, the sinister alter ego consumes his unraveling mind, pushing him to the brink of violence. Is the method actor succumbing to madness? Or has the devilish reaper taken on a life of its own? The Larkin siblings are known around the small town of Wooford Falls. Both are artists, but Peter Larkin, Lark to his friends, is the hometown hero. The one who went to the big city and got famous, then came back and settled down. He's the kind of guy who becomes fast friends with almost anyone. His sister, Betsy, on the other hand, is more eccentric. She keeps to herself. When Lark goes to deliver one of his latest pieces to a fabulously rich buyer, it seems like a regular transaction. Even being met at the gate of the sprawling, secluded estate by an intimidating security guard seems normal. Until the guard plays him a live feed, Betsy being abducted in real time. Lark is informed that she's safe for now, but her well-being is entirely in his hands. He's given a book. Do what the book says and Betsy will go free. It seems simple enough, but as Lark begins to read, he realizes the book might be demonic. Its writer may be unhinged. His sister's captors are almost certainly not what they seem and his town and those within it are changing, and the only way out is through. Liz Rocher is coming home reluctantly. As a black woman, Liz doesn't exactly have fond memories of Johnstown, Pennsylvania, a predominantly white town, but her best friend is getting married, so she braces herself for a weekend of awkward and passive-aggressive reunions. Liz has grown, though, she can handle whatever awaits her. But on the day of the wedding, somewhere between dancing and dessert, the bride's daughter Caroline goes missing, and the only thing left behind is a piece of white fabric covered in blood. As a frantic search begins, with the police combing the trees for Caroline, Liz is the only one who notices a pattern, a summer night, a missing girl, a party in the woods. She's seen this before. Kesha Woodson, the only other black girl in school, walked into the woods with a mysterious man and was later found with her chest cavity ripped open and her heart missing. Liz shudders at the thought that it could have been her, and now, with Caroline missing, it can't be a coincidence. 
As Liz starts to dig through the town's history, she uncovers a horrifying secret about the place she once called home. Children have been going missing in these woods for years, all of them black, all of them girls. With the evil in the forest creeping closer, Liz knows what she must do, find Caroline, or be entirely consumed by the darkness. On the idyllic island of Loot, every seventh summer, seven people die, no more, no less. Loot and its inhabitants are blessed year after year with good weather, good health, and good fortune. They live a happy superior life, untouched by the war that rages all around them. So it's only fair that every seven years, on the day of the tithe, the island's gift is honored. Nina Treadway is new to the day. A Florida girl by birth, she became a lady through her marriage to Lord Treadway, whose family has long protected the island. Nina's heard about the day, of course. Heard about the horrific tragedies, the lives lost, but she doesn't believe in it. It's all superstitious nonsense. Stories told to keep newcomers at bay and youngsters in line. Then the day begins, and it's a day of nightmares, of grief, of reckoning. But it is also a day of community, of survival and strength, of love at its most pure and untamed. When the day ends, Nina and Loot will never be the same. Of all the things aspiring artist Haven Marbury expected to find while clearing out her late father's remote seaside house, bedtime stories for monsters was not on the list. This secret handwritten manuscript is disturbingly different from his Pulitzer winning works. Its interweaving short stories crawl with horrific monsters and enigmatic humans that exist somewhere between this world and the next. The stories unsettle but also entice Haven, practically compelling her to illustrate them while she stays in the house that her father warned her was haunted. Reeling from a failed marriage, Haven hopes an illustrated bedtime stories can be the lucrative posthumous father-daughter collaboration she desperately needs to jumpstart her art career. However, everyone in the nearby vacation town wants a piece of the manuscript. Her father's obsessive literary salon members, the ink drinkers. Her mysterious yet charming neighbor who has a tendency toward 3 a.m. bonfires. A young barista with a literary forgery business. And of course, whoever keeps trying to break into her house. But when a monstrous creature appears under Haven's bed, right as grisly deaths are reported in the nearby woods, she must race to uncover a dark, otherworldly family secrets, completely rewriting everything she ever knew about herself in the process. Rory Morris isn't thrilled to be moving back to her hometown, even if it is temporary. There are bad memories there, but her twin sister Scarlet is pregnant, estranged from the baby's father, and needs support. So Rory returns to the place she thought she'd put in her rear view. After a night out at a bar where she runs into an old almost flame, she hits a large animal with her car, and when she gets out to investigate, she's attacked. Rory survives miraculously, but life begins to look and feel different. She's unnaturally strong, with an aversion to silver, and suddenly the moon has her in its thrall. She's changing into someone else, something else, maybe even a monster. But does that mean she's putting those close to her in danger? Or is embracing the wildness inside of her the key to acceptance? 1920s England Sarah Piper's lonely, threadbare existence changes when her temporary agency sends her to assist an obsessed ghost hunter. Alistair Gillies, rich, handsome, and scarred by World War I, has been summoned to investigate the spirit of the 19-year-old maid Maddie Clare, who is said to haunt the barn where she committed suicide. Maddie hated men in life, and she will not speak to them in death. 
But Sarah is unprepared to confront an angry ghost, real or imagined, on her own. She's even less prepared for the arrival of Alistair's associate, rough, unsettling Matthew Ryder, also a veteran of the trenches, whose scars go deeper than Sarah can reach. Soon, Sarah is caught up in a desperate struggle, for Maddie's ghost is no hoax. She's real, she's angry, and she has powers that defy all reason. Now, Sarah and Matthew must discover who Maddie was, where she came from, and what is driving her desire for vengeance before she destroys them all. When two former friends reunite after decades apart, their grudges, flawed ambitions, and shared obsession swirl into an all-too-real echo of a terrible town legend. Centuries ago, beautiful young Isbeth Clark was accused of witchcraft after several children disappeared. Her acquittal did nothing to stop her fellow townsfolk from drowning her in the well where the missing children were last seen. When author and social media influencer Elena returns to the summer paradise of her youth to get her family's manor house ready to sell, the last thing she expected was connecting with and feeling inspired to write about Isbeth's infamous spirit, the very historical figure that her ex-childhood friend, Kathy, has been diligently researching and writing about for years. What begins as a fiercely competitive sense of ownership over Isbeth and her story soon turns both women's worlds into something more haunted and dangerous than they could ever imagine. So those are all the books that have already been released. I'm definitely going to be adding Luda and It Looks Like Us to my own TBR as well as Such Sharp Teeth. I would really like to read that one eventually. So many great ones coming out next week, so be sure you come back and see what's coming up. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you have a spectacular October and I will see you in the next one.